A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost. But for that reason, I was mercifully treated, so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the king of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verbum Domini. Blessed be the name of the Lord forever. Praise, you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forever. From the rising to the setting of the sun is the name of the Lord to be praised. High above all nations is the Lord. Above the heavens is his glory. Who is like the Lord our God and looks upon the heavens and the earth below? He raises up the lowly from the dust. From the dunghill, he lifts up the poor. Dominus Fobiscum, et cum Spiritus Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam, Gloria Jesus said to his disciples, A good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For people do not pick figs from thorn bushes, nor do they gather grapes from brambles. A good person out of the store of goodness in his heart produces good, but an evil person out of a store of evil produces evil. For from the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I command. I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, listens to my words, and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on rock. When the flood came, the river burst against that house, but could not shake it because it had been built well built. But the one who listens and does not act is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, 
It collapsed at once and was completely destroyed. Verbum Domini. Today we celebrate the memorial of Saint Cornelius, who was a pope, and Saint Cyprian, who was the bishop of Carthage at the same time. And both uh, were, were martyred. They lived in a time of great persecution. This is around 250 uh, AD. And the church was really torn at by different challenges. They had a plague raging. They had uh, a question of the validity of baptism by heretical Christians. And they had a question of those who had lapsed. It was a time of great persecution uh, by Decian uh, of the church. And that those had apostatized from the faith, were they to be, after baptism, were they to be readmitted? And some said no, and others took uh, what would be considered a very lax position. Cyprian wrote, uh, he wrote much. We have many, much of the things that he wrote in letters. And he said to readmit them after a period of penance. So a demand for conversion. And it's hard to judge these things so long ago. We don't know the full circumstances and ways of thinking and the mindset at the time. But they suffered for the faith. Cornelius uh, was, uh, Pope Cyprian was, or Bishop Cyprian was uh, beheaded for the faith. Cornelius died in exile. Cyprian knew human weakness from the inside. He was converted himself from a very worldly life. He was from a rich pagan family. He lived a dissipated youth. And he converted to Christianity at the age of 35. And he would write of himself, he said, when I was still lying in darkness and gloomy night, I used to regard it as extremely difficult and demanding to do what God's mercy was suggesting to me. I myself was held in bonds by the innumerable errors of my previous life from which I did not believe I could possibly be delivered. So I was disposed to acquiesce in my clinging vices and to indulge in my sins. But after that, by the help of the water of new birth, the stain of my former life was washed away, and a light from above, serene and pure, was infused into my reconciled heart. A second birth restored me to a new man. Then, in a wondrous manner, every doubt began to fade. I clearly understood that what had first lived within me, enslaved by the vices of the flesh, was earthly, and, what, and that what instead the Holy Spirit had wrought within me was divine and heavenly. So a man caught up in his sins, was baptized, and we could say received the other sacraments, was strengthened to turn from the life of sin and vice and to live a holy and good, pure life. That's a beautiful image of God's mercy towards us. He writes of that so poetically and well that God's mercy reaches out to us. John Paul II would emphasize that it restores us to value you know, in the forgiving us our sins. We, we've lost our dignity, in a sense, in sin, collectively, in Adam and Eve, in original sin, then our own personal sin. And God's mercy reaches out to us and lifts us back, pulls us out of the state of darkness and the state of sin. And we experience that, that mercy is poured upon us, especially in the sacraments, the baptism, Eucharist, a confession, Mercy, God's mercy is greater than human sin. Sin can't limit it or prevail over it. God's mercy has conquered sin and death. I remember we went to Poland for World Youth Day about a year ago and going to Auschwitz and, you know, the, it's a cold, hard place. You think about what happened there and you're reminded how you know, God's mercy, forgiveness of sin, 
is prevails over evil. We see, we, you know, we talked about the saints that were there, Maximilian Kolbe, Edith Stein, and how they were victorious, even though they lost their lives, that God's mercy and love is victorious there, is not conquered. You know, the evil doesn't have the last word. That, uh, you know, God's, through God's mercy, experience of forgiveness, and uh, his grace, you know, overcomes sin, does not prevail against it. So the only limit on it is from us, on our part. We can limit God's mercy by our lack of goodwill, our lack of readiness to be converted, to repent, to recognize our sin. You know, if we don't have a desire to turn from that sin, to be converted, we're limiting, we're pushing God away from us. You know, if we're persistent and obstinate, an opposing grace and truth, if we have a final impenitence, you know, that limits, of course, God's mercy. We must be converted. And that in conversion, it's always a rediscovery of the Father who is rich in mercy, John Paul II would write. Pope Francis would describe it that God gets there first. You know, when we turn back to him, maybe at this point in our life, God's already there waiting for us. He gives us grace, giving his mercy, that even the conversion is by his grace, but we have to have an openness to it. And when we experience that mercy, conversion is the fruit. It's a fruit of mercy where we are given that power, that grace to change our life. But there is a cooperation on our part as the prodigal son must return to the father's house and when he goes back, he is in a place of deep surrender. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He recognizes his, his weakness. He recognizes his sinfulness, that he's lost that dignity of sonship in a sense, in his own mind. Treat me as one of your hired servants. God's mercy, though, the father, you know, restores him to sonship and kills the fatted calf, clothes them, and sandals on his feet, the ring and staff, his finger. You know, his, his mercy lifts us up, restores us to value. But the son did have a deep surrender of coming back to the father's house to do whatever the father would lead him to do, tell him to do. Paul in 1 Timothy, in the first reading today, himself as well has a deep experience of this. He writes that, Jesus came to save sinners. You know, I am the foremost of these sinners. He knows God's mercy. He's knocked to the ground in the bright light, converts his life. He was killing Christians. He was opposing the Lord. He was kicking against the goad. And he has this deep conversion. He witnesses in his life to a deep humility, a deep turning to the Lord. He says, I was mercifully treated had a deep sense of receiving God's mercy, that this is God's work in us. I was in darkness. My thinking was messed up. I was ignorant, or maybe I was, uh, you know, maybe I had a bad spirit about me, or I knew what I was doing and it was wrong. He didn't know, he, he speaks of, you know, that he didn't get it, so to speak, but certainly we could be on either end there but he was mercifully treated, that he might display all his patience as an example in me. We see the patience of God working in St. Paul's life, that he models to the rest of the church as he's going to be this apostle, this great missionary, that he models in his life that the foundation of the church is built on forgiveness that it's the place of forgiveness, that the church is holy, yet it's made up of sinners. Sinners need of conversion, sinners on the way, sinners who need forgiveness. He models that in his life, St. Paul does. Jesus gives us strong words that we are not to presume upon this mercy. We don't just call out to the Lord, have no conversion, have no seeking of his will, that we do not do what is command. He's telling us 
we can't do that. You just can't cry out, Lord, and have no desire to give the obedience of faith. He says, the one who listens to my words and acts on them is the one who builds his house on rock. But the floods will come against this house. But if we listen to the words, we hear them and act upon them, we've built our life on rock. And I think that's such a, a great thing to remember in our own life because sometimes we can think, well, it's about just about desire or some powerful feeling or emotion or some spiritual experiences or something that we've had. And he's kind of cutting through all that. He says, no, you must put my words into practice. That's how you have a solid life. That's how you have a good life. That's how we lead a life of peace and joy. That's how we have a, a fruitfulness to our life, by acting upon these words that we hear in the gospel. That's conversion. Not all the showy stuff that we can do, but that we've really converted our life to his gospel truth. You know, today, I think it's a good reminder that the truth is pastoral. Being converted to that gospel truth is the pastoral message we need to give to the world, that that truth blesses us, that that is the place where our life will achieve a fullness, where our life will truly be fruitful, that we can serve others, we can give ourselves generously in the deepest way by living uh, that truth that Jesus teaches us.